Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to a very exciting episode. I'm hosting Cal Inman, the founder of Climate Check, an online real estate climate risk data tool that identifies current risk exposure to climate impacts such as drought, floods, and sea level rise. Cal and I will discuss how the real estate sector is getting their heads around climate change and how increasingly sophisticated home buyers are factoring in future climates when making home purchases. Cal will also explain what is Climate Check and how you can use this tool to see what your home climate impact is. It's a great conversation with Cal. So I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the passing of a beloved adaptation leader, Nina Hall. Nina passed away in December, having battled cancer for the past year. I actually never met or worked with Nina, but I have heard from the adaptation community about the incredibly important work she did in the adaptation space. My friend Jesse Keenan knew her well and said what an incredibly effective communicator she was. He also deeply appreciated her skills as an editor. Nina was instrumental in the development of the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit. I want to read a couple paragraphs from a moving tribute some of her colleagues wrote for her. Professionally, we all benefited from her generosity as she freely shared her time, wisdom, and keen editorial eye. It was apparent that she loved working with others and always brought positive energy, good humor, great ideas, and a clear passion for protecting the environment. We're incredibly grateful to have had the opportunity to work closely with Nina over these last eight years. On a personal level, we also came to know and love Nina as a friend. We admire her for her courage in confronting hard truths, her tactful ability to communicate clearly, and her humility in insisting that she not be taken too seriously. Nina was playful, her laughter was infectious, and she was always up for a good hike, a good meal, or a good conversation over a drink together with friends. I highly recommend you take the time to read the entire tribute. There's a link in my show notes. My deepest condolences to those who knew her best. Okay, upcoming episodes. I interviewed Elise Kari, a PhD student at the University of Miami, who also starred and produced a series on PBS focusing on adaptation around the world. Also, Lori Schumann of the Enterprise Community Partners comes on to discuss affordable housing and climate change. I'm also in the early stages of producing an episode on adaptation in Colorado. Some great episodes are in the pipeline. Okay, let's join Cal and learn how the real estate sector is taking on climate change. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to an exciting episode. Joining me today is Cal Inman, founder and CEO of Climate Check, a climate risk data service. Hey, Cal, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So we're going to talk about real estate and some of these tools that you've created. We're going to cover a lot of ground here, and you've shared some information with me. And so I don't get to talk sort of casually about this as much as I want to, but let's just get a little bit more background with you. And I, we're going to go talk more specifically about the tool Climate Check, about what it does, but just, just broadly, w- what is it? Climate Check is a climate risk data company, and we provide insights to individual properties, areas, whatever geography, what, what is your risk to climate change? And that's very high level what, what we do. What is your background? Are you a technical guy? How did you get to where you're at? You founded this company. How did you, what's that journey? My background's not tech. It's actually in the built environment. Been a real estate developer for the last 15 years. Do small urban infill projects. I kind of came to this climate risk data Just kind of as the end consumer, I was always curious, are my rental properties going to flood with sea level rise in the Bay? Do I have a risk of fire? And I was always kind of curious, mostly, you know, you're renewing an insurance policy and you're thinking about natural disasters. About four years ago, I started lecturing at UC Berkeley. That's where I came across all these great climatologists, all this interesting science and really rich data around climate risk. And uh, wow, I'd love to see what my exposure to this stuff is. And it was really hard to access, really hard to understand, especially if you don't have a PhD in this stuff. That kind of started our journey. We wanted to make this data more accessible to everyone. You have a pretty technical team there, though. Can you describe how you recruited these folks? I mean, I recognize some of the names there, but you have, you know, you go to Climate Jack and you look at your team, you know, you've got some all-stars there. Who are they and why are these people making up your team? Yeah, totally. I mean, you think about my background, I need to rely on a lot of smart people that understand this stuff and are in the weeds. Uh, And so we started off building the team just with scientific advisors. 
folks that are researching this stuff, reading the research and are on top of it to kind of guide us in the right direction. And we really rely on that part of our team. And then the rest of our team is made up of folks that just code, data scientists, uh, R and Python, and processing, synthesizing this data. And then kind of the final step is visualization and how we communicate this, you know, seemingly very complex information to someone that just wants to see, hey, what's the future risk of flood for for my home? And so I think making it really simple and easy to understand is kind of the final step. So everyone on the team is codes or specializes in visualization. And then we rely on this group of scientific advisors to point us in the right direction for, for the best climate data sets. Okay. One of your advisors, I see is Dr. Daniel Swain. I actually had him on the podcast a while ago, and he has a really popular Twitter feed just covering a lot of the the weather patterns out West. Yeah. He's owning social media and great insights, super smart guy. Yeah. Very. So we're going to approach this conversation two ways. We're going to come back to what you're doing at Climate Check toward the end. But you had shared with me a presentation given by the chief economist at Redfin. And I want to talk a bit about that because I think it more broadly talks about some of these issues. And the the presentation itself was climate change and housing. And so I, I thought we could start there. Let's talk about this presentation. And if you're looking for it, it's, it's, and I'll have a link in the show notes, Climate Change and Housing by Daryl Fairweather, the chief economist at Redfin. When Redfin is, you know, a big real estate, how do you even describe an online real estate firm? How would you describe them? Yeah, it's a, a listing portal, real estate listing portal. So most people know Redfin, but just, I mean, Zillow probably is a little bit more well-known, but the same kind of uh, idea. Broadly, the name of the, this thing is saying climate change will make the housing crisis worse. It's all about you know the issues of climate change and how it's going to impact the real estate sector. Could you share on why climate change is going to make the housing crisis worse? Yeah, I think Daryl's kind of put this in as an important thing, data point to look at for economics and particularly around housing. I think as we all start ingesting more and more data, climate seems like an obvious, I wouldn't even call it a long tail event, you know, like COVID or something, but our minds are on these these events that are going to disrupt the economics and markets. And so I think uh, all eyes are on climate change right now. Uh, It's just the topic du jour for good reason. I'm glad the conversation's around it. The data right now is not, there's a real asymmetry in the data. Uh, Climate risk data is used within commercial real estate and by government agencies right now to inform decisions. Uh, You had a great podcast with uh, Jesse Keenan going through what every organization is doing. And then you think about the consumer, and and that's where the asymmetry of information is. The consumer really doesn't have access to this information. I think as it becomes more democratized, more people have access to it, decisions will be made around it. And I think, you know, generally that's a, a good thing. And I think the second reason, it's going to change the housing market. It's just we're seeing a higher frequency and intensity of these events with flooding, fires, droughts, everything that we present in our data. So I think those are probably the two high level reasons it's going to have an impact on the housing market. Yeah. And I think people probably who might not be following the climate side of this, but there is a housing crisis. And you know, it, it obviously is it worse in some cities or states than other states. But what this presentation I was saying is more broadly nationally that we're going to just have a shortage of houses and climate change just isn't going to help. Yeah, I think we're also seeing development patterns. And look, we provided just full disclosure, we provided climate data to Redfin and, you know, they're smart economists doing good work over there. But I, I think from my armchair economist here, I, I, we, a lot of our development pattern is into kind of the wooey, the, the more suburban, exurban areas. And we've seen a lot of that migration during COVID, right? And these are riskier areas. These aren't densely developed urban core with a lot of defenses to all these hazards that we're experiencing. So I think that that's kind of exacerbating the, the risk to housing. This presentation, and again, I encourage people to go through it. Part of what they did is they sort of explained the housing situation, but then they pivot and they did this survey. I think it's about 3,000 people that Redfin itself, I think, did the survey. And they just asked a bunch of questions related to climate change and patterns of where people are going to purchase things. And it was, you know, it was an interesting experiment in some ways that how people does extreme weather play into your decision to buy homes? You know, are you thinking of moving because of these things? Do you remember sort of what kind of stood out with you in the questions and sort of the results that were happening? 
Yeah, you know, in general, we're working with a lot of listing portals. It's part of our core mission to make this information more accessible. And so that means tying it to real estate listings. And what's interesting when you're working with the listing, these these big groups is they do a lot of qualitative and quantitative research. I think what really stands out to me, surprising, but, you know, made me happy is folks are curious about this. They want to know they're experiencing these events and they want to access this information. It's not as political and uh, as you might expect. And so I think generally that's what stands out to me with all of these surveys that the listening portals do. Some of the questions I'm going to read here is just, you know, in one of them, they talked about people that were planning to move. So half of those people who were surveyed said extreme weather played a role in their decision to move. And I think I have that right. And then three-fourths of Americans surveyed it said they'd be hesitant to buy homes with climate risk. So I know this isn't your survey, but to be honest, I don't buy these numbers. I just can't. Is your own experience in the real estate sector, your American home buyer is not that sophisticated around climate issues. And they're saying three quarters of American surveys, they're worried about climate risk that factors in, or is your inexperience saying they are? Yeah. I mean, I can't speak to that exact study, but I can speak even as a developer of, of homes is there's a lot of factors people are consider, right? Price point, location, proximity to their family, school districts. And so I think People are adding this in as something they're thinking about, especially as they're experiencing you know, higher temperatures or or, or they're reading about it in the press every day. And so I, I do think it's a factor folks are considering. Is it the primary factor? Probably not. But I do think there's a lot more awareness around environmental issues and location, especially after COVID. And so I, I think it is a factor people are thinking about. I don't I can't speak to the 75 percent. I just thought that. <laughs> I was thinking, all right, who did they survey? Was it a board meeting of the Sierra Club or something? And but uh, <laughs> I mean, um, you moved to Tucson. So. All right. Well, we're going to get back to that later. But um, <laughs> now, when I saw these numbers, like, who are these people? But, you know, I should probably invite Redfin on and, you know, they could talk even about the survey itself. It'd be interesting to sort of the what went into s- selecting people. But anyway, we spent a little bit more time on the survey. And at, at the end, they do do make a point of recommending what government, the, the role government can have, and I guess discouraging certain purchasing behaviors and helping people. To, what are your thoughts in regards to the role of government in, in helping people decide where to buy a home and, and, and all these things? And it, it gets tricky too, because you know home buying is at the individual level. A government really is only going to kind of, well, we want you to avoid buying homes in this high risk flooding area as opposed to a, in this location. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of role uh, for government and policy and regulation. But I think even before that is allowing the consumer, who also, the you know, the constituents of all these agencies, access to the information, let them make informed decisions ar- around where they're buying or how they're protecting their homes, their biggest assets. And I think that's really our role, not necessarily as a, a policymaker to suggest you know, what regulations go forward from a government side, but but really just providing individual consumers, homeowners, home buyers, home sellers with this climate risk information. I think the market will also make some decisions from that. Do you find in times like right now, where, I don't know, I'm sure California is always sort of a, a buying boom and here in Tucson and Arizona, it's just crazy. The, the real estate has gone through the roof. Does that overwhelm the signal that you might get with people making decisions around climate risk? You know, you might get those things at the margin, but overall, there's such interest in buying homes that you, it's hard to take out that signal. I mean, I think that's right. You know, there's kind of been back and forth about, you know, how, how strong are the climate signals? But and the reality is we have scarcity of housing and a shortage, uh, a real shortage of housing. And there's a lot of factors that we think about when we're, we're thinking about where to buy. And I think it's hard to discern what that is. And again, if there's not access to the information, then the signal it might not be that strong. But I, I think it will grow over time as people are more aware of it. And as they continue to experience, you know, the, the impacts of, of these events. Well, I encourage people to check out. It, it is an interesting it, Redfin puts their uh, climate cap on and, and they're thinking about these issues. So I think a lot of people who are in the adaptation space. I think it'd be re- very interesting how they kind of view that universe. And it's obviously going to just get bigger for them. I want to pivot again and we're going to come back to Climate Check, the company that you've founded. And I want people to get their heads around that. If you could describe, and I'm going to encourage people listening right now, if you're on your phone or in your computer, just it's literally climatecheck.com, C-H- 
E C K like climatecheck.com. And you could plug in, you know, your own zip code, your own house, and you can follow along as we're having this conversation. If you don't want to stick in your individual home, that's fine. You can put in a city and you can get more broadly about the area that you live in, but that could be kind of fun to follow along. But Cal climate check, what is it specifically? What is it doing? Yeah. So we're aggregating all of this climate data and we focus right now on five hazards and we're rolling out a few more. So right now we look at flood, fire, precipitation, extreme heat, and drought. And we look at, hey, what is your risk today in a specific location? And then what's your risk in the future under these certain climate change scenarios? Uh, We look at RCP 8.5 and RCP 4.5. And I'm trying to, I think this is a, a language your audience will understand. Then we take in all the data, synthesize it, and pull out kind of key metrics that make it easy to understand. So I'll just give you a a simple example. When someone's searching their home on our website, we'll look at extreme heat. Within a five kilometer grid across the United States, we have downscale climate data for heat. We tell you what a hot day is in your area currently, and we define that as the top 2% of days. So what are the two top 2% hottest days in your area. And that happens around seven to eight times a year currently. And then, and we say, how many more hot days are you can have in the future with climate change? And, and so if you look at somewhere, you know, like your home in Tucson, if you have eight today, it's probably going up in the future. It might say you have 25 days in the future. And that kind of gives you just good context of what is the effect of extreme heat at your location. Now, when you go through... That's the very high level, we call it snapshot results page when you type in your address. And then you can pull a full report where we give a lot more data of how these factors are changing over time. And then also geographic comparison with maps and whatnot. So we do we do that with flooding, precipitation, fire, and drought. And so we're just trying to give just good climate risk information for specific property specific information and that that's what the website is and then we'll use that data to provide it to all sorts of different folks so real estate analytics stakeholders within commercial real estate and then like we were talking about kind of more of the consumer driven listing portals and commercial listing portals so and what that means is like specific real estate listing sites that show real estate listing data the price of a property the size of the property, how many beds and baths there is, the school district. And we're appending this climate risk data into a lot of those locations. Okay. So I think this will be fun. You can just kind of walk me through this. I obviously plugged in my home here in Tucson, but I also plugged in where I used to live in Sarasota, Florida. So two very different kind of areas to do this in. So here in Tucson, I just want you, we have these different ratings. And again, if you didn't catch that one through a hundred, if you get a hundred, obviously the worst risk you can have one, meaning very low risk. And so heat in Tucson, 66, drought, 28, which was kind of surprised it was that low storm, 16, Fire four, flood one. So almost zero risk with flooding, which is kind of interesting because we have the monsoon season. But, you know, I think they've done the development around here for so long that the roads flood, but the idea of your homes don't flood that often. So that that was interesting. Now, I want to jump before you, you jump in here yourself for Sarasota, where I live there, the heat risk. And this surprised me, 100 And you can explain, and then flood risk, 89, I I get that. And then storm risk, 64, drought risk, 30, fire risk, one. And the heat risk in Florida was higher than here in Tucson, which is notoriously hot and going to get hotter with climate change. Why why the discrepancy? Yeah, I'd have to pull up the two specific addresses. But I I think as you're looking at it, what is the number of future days, hot days for each of those areas? Doug, this is fun. Well, I, I love tools like this. You plop it in. It's like, okay, what's it going to be? And now it's like, all right, well, we're ground truthing it. I've got the founder on. Let's just dig through this thing, right? When we roll over your property in Florida, 95 is a hot day there. You have eight hot days a year. By 2050, projected experience about 87 hot days a year. Wow. So it's going from eight to 87. So the frequency in which you're going to experience these hot days is going up. And compare that to your property in Tucson. Right now, we look at the local hot temperature because we assume people understand what a hot day is there. They're acclimated to that 
what those weather patterns and more importantly, the infrastructure is built for that. So think about insulation in a home or air conditioning. So if, if you in Tucson, it's 106 degrees. So it's a hotter day. But in the future, you're going to have 45 of those. So it's going from eight to 45. There's a 5x change in Tucson. But in Florida, it's going to be 10. The number of hot days you're going to be having is so much greater in Florida. And that wow. factors into our rating. And that's why your Florida property gets a lot higher number. Now, we also are adding in wet bulb temperatures because yeah. that is important to consider when you're thinking about heat, especially safety. And just so it's clear to folks, the flood risk, is that factoring in? That's sea level rise. So a place that's on the coast, that is that factoring that? That's the category for sea level rise? Yeah, it's for anyone kind of perusing the website right now, it, it's built around a specific address, latitude, longitude point, and that's important uh, for flood. So flood is sea level rise, but we also look at storm surge, which is a coastal flooding hazard, but we also look at inland flooding, fluvial and pluvial flooding, so surface flooding and river flooding. And then in the full report, we also give kind of a, a FEMA baseline to show you, you know, where does FEMA put your property? That's fun. I encourage people to plug in their address to kind of get a sense. And I think it's good to ground truth it. And you've already sort of talked about some of the data that underlines this, like, is it accurate? How far does it go out? And so people are putting it in today. If you get a full report, it explains how far you're going out. So if you're looking for a lot more of that information, it's there. So just don't look at the numbers. There's a lot of context that you guys are giving. Yeah. Yeah. And I th- the other thing is we post our methodologies on the website and we're very transparent about our data sources, our methodologies, and trying to get away from black box climate risk data sets and models and, and just using straightforward government and academic data sets and, and really trying to present what it is and, and communicate in a simple way. One of the things I was going to ask is if you guys get prescriptive and you do somewhat. So if you do a full report, so you can generate a full report, it gets sent to you. And at the end of each section, fire, flood risk, it talks about things that you can do at an individual level, at your home level to minimize these things. And so insulation or, you know, they're just basic things that you could do to make your house more resilient to some of these specific risks. When I saw that, I'm like, okay, these all make sense. But if you are in a high risk area, like there in Florida, you guys don't get into the business of being prescriptive descriptive of there's not a category that says you should move away from here as soon as you can. I mean, you guys just don't want to go there, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's not the, we're not taking the fear-based approach and more just, Hey, these are the risks. And then how can we help you? We're not trying to say move or sell your property today, get out and let someone else be left with the consequences. But try just to start the conversation. How can you protect your home? But then also for some conversations, like how can you engage with your local government, your elected officials, your municipality and county and state? And what can you do as a community to mitigate some of these risks? And so I think it it starts on the, the home level. I think it engages the consumer who's also a constituent about the risks to their assets And I I think there's stuff you can be doing on the property level, which we provide and are constantly building out. Uh, But also, I think there's things we can do on the community level, too. At the individual level, you do get prescriptive on those things that they could do. But as you can imagine, let's say you're you're a city urban planner or even a federal person kind of make because there's there's money that's being directed. You're familiar with managed retreat. It's the idea of like, okay, these areas, they're going underwater and it'd just be crazy to kind of stay there long term. They could use their tool to sort of say, wow, this whole area is really at extreme risk. We can use it to sort of set a baseline to, you know, because there are funding pots now to help people move out of areas. And so even though you guys as a company are not encouraging people to move, but you can kind of see where policymakers and decision makers could use the tool to head in that direction. And I, listen, you, you don't necessarily agree with that. I obviously encourage that. The more sophisticated the planning tools they have, the better, and people shouldn't live in some areas. But what do you, what do you think of those kind of uh, policy decisions that could be made with your tool? Definitely. I think there's a lot of use cases there, and it's not so public on the website, but we have a lot of more enterprise tools where you can search geographic areas and get summaries of rooftops, see how many homes are are subject to some type of flood risk. And we see it used a lot in commercial real estate to make decisions around where to buy properties and and where to develop. But I do think there's a strong use case for uh, policymakers to, to look at 
the data wrapped up in kind of a simple summary and, and start making decisions around it. I think it's a, a, a great use of the data. I find it fascinating too, when you start beta testing a, a new tool, what's the sort of feedback that you've gotten? Like someone will just say, all right, I plugged in my address. And you, I mean, you must get, even though your underlying data, you're very confident in what, what's been your sort of experience. Cause it's helpful to you, right? Someone says, all right, I'm here in North Dakota. Oh, it helps you kind of tweak. I mean, are, are people really testing it and then giving you any feedback? Yeah, completely. That's a great point. And we've been at it public for two years now. And we get, you know, the the internet's a vocal place. We get all sorts of feedback and it's been very productive. Uh, We log all of it and we've made a lot of tweaks to how we present the data, what data we're presenting, what data sets we need to bring in. And that the ongoing live feedback is a great quality assurance tool. Yeah, we're always updating the data sets. We're doing a big update on the methodologies that we're bringing in for wildfire, for instance, based on a lot of just individual consumer feedback. Because just like your your property in Tucson is, you know that property so much better than someone looking you know, at the entire contiguous United States uh, on a map level, you know how hot it is at your property. You know, you, you've got a good feeling about what your water risk is and your fire risk. Uh, and so we really rely on that that feedback from the consumer. And it's, it's helped us really improve our product a lot. And so we welcome all, all feedback and engage with everyone that, that sends us a note, which are, there are a lot of people. I, I'd love to get back to Tucson, Doug. And why did you move to Tucson? Well, besides the hiking, which obviously was the number one reason, you know, I was living in DC before this and it was just too cold. So climate was the primary driver at why I moved here. And so I was either going to move to Florida or Arizona. And just this might be interesting to you too, because California was in the mix too, but it's just real estate kept me away, kept our family away. And so Arizona and Florida were the, like the last two remaining things. And so the climate was the primary driver of moving here. I, I do something that I can do anywhere. And I've just been trying to get out West forever, but yeah, that in Florida is just kind of crazy. So I didn't want to move back there. So yeah, that's, that's basically why I moved here. I mean, to your point about signals in the market, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to move, but you talk about climate every day that, you know, the smartest people in the industry and how do you reconcile climate and climate change and and the location you're in now. How, how do you think about that on a personal level? Yeah, good question. You know, my, my friend Sean Martin at World Wildlife Fund, he he's been hassling me about this. Why did you move to Tucson? He'll send me articles like mega droughts, the Southwest, and it's completely legitimate and fair question. And I guess I justified it because I was thinking more short term and the real estate, you know, cost that factored in too. And it probably overplayed the climate signal. So I knew there was drought issues, but Tucson actually is a bit more resilient than I even realized before I moved here when it comes to its water resources. Phoenix, I think, has more trouble. You know, Colorado River famously is a big problem for a lot of the Southwest, but Tucson's actually doing a good job. The heat part of it, I go from like eight days to 45 days. That is depressing. And so, and just, you know, I was thinking about this too, that my wife and I are going to, we're going to stay here. I I was a military brat and I always move every three to five years, but she's like, we're not moving again. We're staying here. So I'm going to be here for a while, but my children, I have no sense that they will stay in Arizona. So the idea that like, I'm kind of putting down these really long-term roots here didn't factor in, if, if that makes sense. Some people moved in areas like, well, wait, our generation after generation, I just don't anticipate they've already said they want to move back East. So Maybe that's partly why I can justify. There's not a good reason. I mean, I'm being a hypocrite if you're out there listening. I, Jesse Keenan would have said, Doug, you should have moved to Duluth up north <laughs> and like water resources and the temperatures and no freaking way because the journey between now and when it's going to be more moderate is just too painful. So yeah, but it's fair question. Fair question. Yeah, not critical at all. I mean, I'm in California here, and we got a, a lot of uh, exposure to climate risk. There's a lot of decisions we think about when we're thinking about where to live. So I want to go back as, as we wrap up this conversation, just more broadly about the real estate sector and the, your own experience working in there as a developer. And I, and I think about real estate agents, and I don't know how much experience you have with them, but it's a very common you know profession in every city, real estate. And I, I think of that this tool that you've created, what a great resource for them. And they could easily be ambassadors 
for their clients to talk about climate change. Do you have a sense that that at interface that you know that far down the like the chain are real estate agents actually thinking about climate change? Yeah, it's a complex question. I think we have a lot of interest from certain brokerages, franchises, and agents that are getting questions from their clients about it. And particularly younger generations are asking questions around this. But it's a slow moving industry and it's a bunch of fiefdoms kind of of MLSs and local brokerages. So every area is different. We saw an interesting thing in real estate where there was something called an automated valuation tool, which is basically tells you what a home's worth. And the consumer never had access to it. And Zillow made a big leap and provided the consumer access to what their home is worth. Now we just consider this standard on every real estate listing. But that really changed the kind of adoption within the real estate industry of a data set. And I think we're seeing a similar thing with climate data as the big listing portals like Redfin add climate risk data, the local agents, the local brokers, and the different franchises will need to present that information as well, because the consumer is just going to be asking more and more questions about it. Uh, so I think that evolution is pretty cool of, of data. When we moved here, we did, we had a real estate agent. And I just, I, I wonder if it's a real estate agent, you have to get certified or what are the training or the educational background, but like a consumer that's empowered and they're plugging in on your tool. And they say this to their real estate agents, like, well, look, there's a extreme heat risk here long-term. A real estate agent really should have a sophisticated answer to that. I mean, there's really no excuse. I mean, I, I who actually, has, maybe Zillow or Redfin, hopefully as they're engaging with that's part of what they do. But I mean, don't, don't you agree? Like they need to be a lot more educated around these issues because these questions are only going to come up more. Yeah. And I think that's the sur- fundamental service we're trying to provide is be a third party that they can rely on, go to get good information that they can provide their home buyer, their their home seller with and communicate that that stuff because they, they, real estate agents have a lot going on. They need good resources to answer the questions. The same way they answer questions around termites or home improvement, they rely on other outside third parties to get good information and answer their customers' questions. Well, I'm, I'm certainly generalizing about real estate agents, but I just imagine if you have a sophisticated customer who's just said, you know what, there's a threat of five feet of sea level rise in this area. What are your thoughts on that? And you're going to probably get a lot of blank looks too. When 2070, this is going to be two feet underwater. Not a lot of people are prepared to really sort of explain how to make a market choice today when if a consumer is really empowered with that kind of information. Yeah. Yeah. I think as the conversation evolves, we're all getting educated about it. I, I am for sure. <laughs> Those are some some hard questions. You grilled me about why I moved to Tucson. And as, as we kind of wrap up here, when it comes to real estate and buying homes, it's such a it's a choice that happens at such an individual level. It's like, how do we expect to see changes and your tool is there to empower individuals to inform decisions, but see like more broadly, like bigger decisions being made, how are we going to get there? Like, I guess, landscape decisions and, you know, areas that shouldn't even necessarily be developed. Yeah, I think, I I think it kind of goes back to your your last podcast addressing all what all the different government agencies are doing. And, and I think as this information becomes more ubiquitous, and each stakeholder is informed of what the risks are. I think it makes a much deeper, more meaningful conversation that we're having. I mean, you have all these constituents right now that aren't necessarily aware of what their risks to their homes are, their their life savings is in this home, what the risks are. And I think once you engage constituents, I think, you know, I'm optimistic that it will help a lot of this policy directive and regulation and thoughts uh, leadership that that we need. And I think we need to engage everybody in that conversation, not just the academics and the politicians. What's next for you? What's happening with Climate Check? What's the next six months, next 12 months for you? Man, we're going to continue having fun. We're rolling out a wind hazard. We're building a more robust drought data set. So we're just always focused on data and communication. But we have some really cool integrations coming the end of this year and early next year. And just getting the information out there and appending it to real estate listings and getting it to folks doing analytics and just seeing impact and feedback from that is super rewarding. So yeah, the next six months, six to 12 months are going to be fun. And hopefully our name will be popping up a little bit more. All right. So I asked this of all my guests, if you could recommend one person to come on the podcast to chat with me, who would it be? 
You know what? You have Jesse on a lot. I'd bring him back again. I can never get enough of that guy. <laughs> no. All Incredible. right. He's been on like eight <laughs> times. I'm going to, I'm going to put push back. You get, think about it. If you need a moment, let's get someone and maybe there's someone in the real estate sector that I need to talk, but Jesse will be on many more times. Yeah. Give me a real estate person besides Jesse. Yeah. I, you know, I think bring on an economist from Redfin or Zillow. I think getting their perspective, looking at economics and the the home buying market, I think would be really intriguing because it's a big sector and it's the, the majority of the stakeholders in real estate in the United States are homeowners. And, and how are they thinking about that in the context of climate change? I think that could be really intriguing. No, that'd be great. Love to talk to someone at Zillow or Redfin. So if, if you have any connections, certainly let me know. But if they listen to this, certainly reach out. I, I'd love to get them on. Awesome. All right, Cal, what a treat to talk to you. You're in an area that's obviously very important and you're providing a tool that I think is just going to be in- increasing in value with each passing day. So thanks for coming on and, and sharing what you're doing. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversation and appreciate it. Okay, adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to Cal for coming on and sharing his climate check tool. I highly recommend testing it out. It really is interesting looking at the variety of climate impacts you'll get in your report. Who knew? Florida was at a higher risk of heat stress than Arizona. Well, I guess the experts knew. I'm encouraged that some of the big home listers like Redfin and Zillow are thinking about climate change and giving home buyers more information to make wise purchasing decisions. I still think we have a long way to go where it's actually influencing home ownership in high risk areas. Right now, it's likely just the super climate aware people who are even thinking about this. But think about when you buy a home. What rises to the top of your decision making? Area schools become really important for people with families? Is it a safe neighborhood? Hopefully climate change impacts will rise in stature to these other home buying considerations so it can actually influence the price of the home. And then work its way up to the planners in the city and they start thinking about when and where to approve new housing. It's just not existing housing that should think about these things, but future neighborhoods. We need this level of climate savvy planning at all levels of government. Again, thanks to Cal for coming on. Okay, if you're new to this podcast and you're catching up on all things adaptation, definitely take a look at the podcast library. We have covered a lot of ground that will catch you up on many of the most important adaptation issues, managed retreat, climate reparations, climate impacts on the LGBTQ community, climate finance, national security, indigenous issues, legal implications associated with adaptation, and nature-based solutions to resilience. And that's just scratching the surface. Definitely take a look at the podcast library. Okay, so if you're interested in highlighting your adaptation work at a podcast, consider sponsoring a whole podcast episode of America Adapts. Sponsoring a podcast allows you to focus on the work you're doing and sharing with climate professionals from around the world. I frequently go on location to record these sponsored podcasts, which allows you a wider diversity of guests to participate. You'll work with me to identify experts that represent the work that you're doing. I've done these with NRDC, University of Pennsylvania at Wharton, World Wildlife Fund, UCLA, Harvard, University of Florida, and some corporate clients. It's a chance to share your story with all my listeners. Most projects have communications written into them. Consider budgeting a podcast. Podcasts have a long shelf life, much more so than a white paper or conference presentation. Many groups work into their communication strategies. My previous sponsors have found the process actually pretty fun since there's a lot of creativity involved. Putting a podcast together is a lot more exciting and satisfying than putting a paper together. Please reach out and let's have a conversation around this so you can learn more. And if you're interested in having me speak at a public or corporate event, please reach out. Folks, I speak to a lot of people. I do keynote presentations. I talk about my own experiences in adaptation and just stories from the podcast. Check me out at americadapts.org. And for my regular listeners, podcasts rely on word of mouth. Please take a moment and plug America Adapts on your favorite social media feeds. I'm on all of them. So just look me up and connect to me and I'll reshare. That is critical for podcast growth. On that note, I love hearing from you. Come on, email me, say hi, tell me what you do. Even if you're not in the adaptation world, I'd like to hear what you guys are doing and how you get value out of the podcast. I'm at americadapts at gmail.com. Send me an email. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.